So there's um, some research that stood the test of time um, called Seven Principles of Good Practice in um, Graduate Education. And all of these are very relevant to group work. But what I'm going to focus on is cooperation and active learning, kind of the middle two. So I'd like you to get acquainted with people. That's one of the goals of um, the TA orientation is that you, you get to meet people outside of your discipline because you will know people in your department rather easily, but it's very rare unless you join the GSA and you attend the socials and other workshops and things that you get to know people outside your department. So if you would, turn to a, part, a partner and uh, focus on the seven principles. I'll put them back up and talk about what the principle means and ways that you could put it into effect. What things could you do, for example, to keep students on task or to promote active learning? So there's your seven principles. Just talk to a neighbor. About two minutes. Hello. Hi. I'm Catherine. Nice to meet you. Uh, what you just did uh, was uh, the peer share. Like it's probably the simplest and best known um, cooperative learning activity. Um, I'm not going to do a report out because report outs take time. The point was you've already done some learning and some sharing and you've gotten appointed with folks. So, whoops. Um, this is the Think, Pair, Share cartoon. Okay, suppose I'd be the one who speaks, you'd be the one. I mean, I'd be the one who thinks, you'd be the one who speaks, good, then we'll switch. That's not really how it works. Um, I want to share something in your handout packet. This is a little article on uh, deep learning. And uh, I recommend that you tag it. It's only four pages long. And it actually changed the way I think about teaching. And I can't go into all of it in a workshop this short. But the premises behind it are motivation, active learning, interaction, and a well-structured knowledge base. So it made me rethink how I use homework. So now what I do is I try to give motivating homework. That hits number one and number four. It gets people into the knowledge base in a motivating way. And instead of just stuffing my, the homework into a briefcase, I take to heart the active learning and the interaction with others. And I typically have some kind of activity that builds on the homework. So that reinforces deep learning. That, that gets people beyond just doing the homework and forgetting about it. Um, they're actually going to build on it, do some kind of activity, at the minimum I think they're share, where they, they talk about the homework. So I'm going to look at active learning, um, deep learning and doing travel together, but doing in itself isn't enough. So you have to think purposefully about why you're using active learning and what's your, your reason for using it. Um, at the very least, it'll keep your students awake, and that's not all bad. Mm -hmm. um, active learning definitions. If you uh, turn to your supplementary handouts, there's some definitions listed there. Um, I'm not going to uh, read them to you. You can read them um, at your leisure. But I think the key point about active learning is Again, action alone is not sufficient. You need to get your students thinking about what they're doing. And I've really become a strong advocate of what's called metacognition, which is thinking about thinking, getting students to reflect on how they learn and if they're learning. Um, I have a daughter that struggled through school. She finally graduated last March. Um, and part of her problem was she couldn't, she couldn't self-assess. She'd study for a math test and say, oh yeah, mom, I'm gonna ace it. And she wouldn't. So if you can build in that metacognition, thinking about thinking, you'll be doing your students a huge service because it's not taught. Okay, we're gonna go into group work through um, what's called a snowball discussion. I had hoped this room would be set up just with chairs rather than the tables. So you're going to kind of have to move around a little bit, but some of you are facing one another. Um, in a snowball discussion, what you do is you pair, and then you pair again. 
So I'll, I'm going to give you um, a question that you'll work on with the partner that you just met for your Think Pair Share, and you'll jot down as many ideas as you can on that topic. Then I'll ask you to join another pair, and at that point, you'll be a foursome, um, or a quad, whatever you want to call it, a team. Um, and then you can work cooperatively for the, the rest of the workshop. So the snowball discussion question is, what are some of the advantages of having students participate actively during class rather than listening passively to lectures? So with your partner, one minute, jot down as many ideas. What are the advantages of having the students actively involved? <laughs> 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 Okay, so let me ask you now to join another team, and what you'll do for about two minutes is share your list and combine, get as long a list as you can, and again, get acquainted with two other people, so you'll leave this room knowing three people. So form a quad, keep brainstorming, same topic, but share. Okay, let me ask for your attention again. Um, I've put folders down by each team, and uh, there's one group that has six folks, um, so you won't be able to have enough playing cards, but I've got some extras here. Um, Open your folder and take out the tenth card. That's going to be your team identity. It's, um, let me borrow yours. Here you go. This team, for example, is, are the sixes. Okay. And then you've got an envelope in there that has playing cards in it. Take out the playing cards and pass them around your team. And the team that has six, I'm going to give you two jokers, but we don't call students jokers. <laughs> we call them wild cards. Students <laughs> don't like to be called jokers. <laughs> and that gives you an identity um, within your uh, within your team. So now I have six teams identified, and I have people in each team that have a given identity, which means I can I can call on people. Now. Using folders is a big step because it implies um, permanent teams. So I'm not suggesting you use folders. They're just convenient for me during the workshop and I do actually use them in my classes. But the folders are really useful um, for those of you that kind of go on into teaching uh, as a classroom management tool because um, you have your identity, and you could do that just with playing cards alone. And I started to do that, but then I realized, no, I've got some stuff that I need you to have, and I didn't want to take time to pass it out, because that's the beauty of the folders. Everything that's needed for a class period is in that folder. So I don't need to worry about passing anything out. So I have team roles that rotate every week, and so they're the obvious roles you think of, the discussion leader, um, the or facilitator, the recorder or the person who does the writing, the reporter, the person who gives the report, and then I have a fourth one, which is the folder monitor. So the folder monitor comes up to the front of the room where I have all the team folders, and they take them back, and if you have expected homework, which I always do, and I want them to use the homework, they're in the folder. So I don't have to alphabetize. I just go to the aces, I can set up my Excel gradebook with the four aces in there, I mark the homework and I slip it right back in the folder. No alphabetizing, no walking around, you know, trying to remember names to pass them out. And uh, the folder monitor is responsible for passing out homework or any other materials and collecting them as well. So we're going to be doing an activity on that blue sheet. Uh, the folder monitor would collect the blue sheet put it in the folder. So I get feedback about what all the teams are doing, especially in large classes, which hopefully you won't have, although my husband's in the English department. He's got 170, 160 people in his lit classes. He's kind of in shock. Um, 
but even in large classes, you can use folders because you just the first um, the first 52 students are in 13 teams with blue folders. Then you put the next 13 um, 52 students in another team with yellow folders, and you still can identify every person because you'll say um, we're going to do a report out on. Uh, I'm going to ask um, someone in to give your team report on some of the ideas you generated. Well, I can do it very easily with something called, lost my clicker now, here we go, luck of the draw, okay? Now, again, any number of, of students can, can play, but since we only have 26, all I have to do is draw a single card and I'll ask that person to share uh, one of the ideas that, that you had in your group. So let me try it. Uh, team six, uh, the person holding the spade, can you please share one of your ideas? <coughs> um. they typically have some background in the subject or they wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. Good point. And uh, it's interesting. I've done a fair amount of research on, on the so-called uh, millennials, and, you know, the, the young whippersnappers in our classes now, the 18-year-olds and so forth. And what, what the millennials and the adult learners have in common is exactly what you said. Uh, they like to share. The millennials are highly social, so they like to talk to one another, and the adults want to talk to one another because they do have things to share. So you're safe with group work. Team five, could your diamond please uh, share one of your ideas? Um, yeah, it allows, uh, oh, we have a bunch of them. Now, it allows to share information across uh, cultures or backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes uh, people realize that not everybody learns the same way, so they be trained. Okay, great. Well, we don't have any A's, so I'm going to fudge it here. Uh, team two, your um, club. Um, one of them we have is that if people are kinetic learners, um, it will help to draw them in, and then it will help the teachers to identify how people are learning. Mm -hmm. When I do the session tomorrow on how people learn, um, humans um, learn moving. And so what do we do? We put people in chairs like this, you know, from behind desks where they're just completely passive. But humans like to move. So whenever you can get them moving, that's, that's a good thing. Okay, what I'd like you to do is take out uh, that blue sheet I reference, and we'll use that for our next activity. And it's called a round table. And a round table is very simple. Um, basically, you, you can do it on anything. It, does, it can be a blank sheet of paper. Um, but you just pass that paper around, and you add one idea when it comes to you. But say it out loud. Because otherwise, you're just watching people write. So when the paper gets to you, you'll say um, a response to the question I'll give you, and then pass it. So it's basically brainstorming. Um, so you don't want, I let students pass because I don't want the brainstorm to turn into a brain drizzle. Okay? So rapidly and energetically pass that paper around. Here's your question. What are some barriers to active learning? 
Um, a lot of people, I, I, I'll, I hear faculty in particular say, oh, my classes are too large. I can't use active learning. Uh, humbug. Of course you can. You can use a think pair share You can do a round table. There's lots of things. But um, you might have some misgivings. You might worry about students um, not participating, for example. You might worry about uh, departments. Uh, if your chair, for example, doesn't like noisy classrooms. Um, you might worry about institutional barriers, such as rooms like this that aren't particularly well suited for group work, but they're better than auditoriums. You can still do it in auditoriums, but you have to get your students in rows where they can turn around, swivel around and talk. Because if you have them sitting and try to talk with four in a row, they can't hear each other when everybody else is talking. But it can be done. And here are some uh, other barriers. Uh, you might worry that students aren't good at groups. Wait a minute, those guys down there are building a lion. Uh, people, especially in the STEM disciplines that are in the other session there, uh, worry about shared ignorance. You'll vote how many here say the hardest for chambers. <laughs> and uh, a lot of you are going to worry about the Calvin student. You can present the material, but you can't make me care. Um, and then uh, I had a friend who got this on his student evaluations. Get a refund, I had to teach myself. Uh, Phil was an accountant and he said, uh, he was very proud of this. He said at least one person figured out what I was trying to do. Uh, because students teaching themselves, are, it's not a bad thing. That means it's in their head. It's their synapses, which we'll talk about. Okay. Um, I deliberately distracted you with cartoons um, because I want to emphasize another thing about group work. It's really important that you have um, clear instructions, that the students know before you start a task exactly what's expected. So let me, and you can do that uh, through an overhead projector, putting the, the um, instructions up. Uh, you can put them in the folder if they're complex, so they might want to have to refer back to them as they're working through maybe a 20-minute group activity. But probably the simplest way is what I'm going to ask you to do now. Just repeat the instructions for the round table. So how many pieces of paper do you have? And <laughs> one, good. And as you're passing it around and writing, what are you doing? Saying it out loud, good. And are you allowed to pass? Yes, you are, because I don't want it to turn into a brain drizzle. Okay, so ready, set, go. Um, about two minutes. You know, like the social loafer, the one who's in the group and doesn't do nothing, and all the other ones are doing the work. And one of the things I did, and it was easy to do here, it's uh, less so in uh, those large auditoriums, um, is monitoring. And basically that just means you're listening. Um, there are lots of reasons to do it. Uh, for one thing, it helps students stay on task. You know, if they know you're going to be sitting down with them, they're going to stop talking about the football game that we haven't had yet, and uh, and focus on the topic. But We're still undefeated. That's <laughs> true. That's true. That's uh, that's a way of making the uh, lemonade. Um, but. What's more important, I think, than, than keeping them on task is, is showing your concern, your interest. Um, in an ideal world, when I have a good room, I can actually sit and listen, so I'm not towering over people. And um, I have a bad knee, so I can't squat, but um, if, if I could, that would be preferable to towering over the students. But basically, you're, you're sending a signal that you really care. You know, you really are interested. I've had, uh, I've seen faculty uh, who s sit up, you know, at their desk and grade papers while the students are doing group work. Well, it's like, okay, I got a great paper, so I'm going to give you some busy work to do. Um, it should always be enforced. You should never do group work just to do group work. There, there should be a reason for it. So that means you, you want to know what your students know, what they're struggling with, what they misunderstand, you'll pick up misconceptions. But I often will use what I hear 
in my mini lecture. If I'm going to give a mini lecture on symbolism, and I had students do an activity on symbolism, I'll, uh, I'll use what I hear. So you're an English major and you are Tom. Um, so I'll give you credit for this. Wow, Tom <laughs> gave the best definition of symbolism I've ever heard. He said, yada, 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 yada. <laughs> well, that sends a signal, not only that I cared, that I listened, that I understood, but I was learning from students. So again, it just sets a very nice tone. So please monitor. Again, I've had faculty say, oh, no, no, I'll, I'll interrupt. Heck no. Yeah, trust me. I'll ignore you. Uh, they're having a much better time with themselves, you know, talking. So, okay, let's do another report out, and we'll do it slightly differently. Uh, this woman is a little forbidding, but I couldn't find too many people standing. Uh, it's called a stand up and share. And in this case, I'm also going to use the playing cards, but what I'll ask is when I call um, a given number, or I'm sorry, a given suit, everyone with that suit in each team will stand with your list and we'll just do a quick rotation. So um, if I call clubs, for example, I'll, I'll have six people standing in the six teams. So aces will give us one, twos immediately give us another one, threes just jump right in, fours, fives, sixes, and we'll do several rotations because you've got a lot of cool ideas there. So, uh, but what I'll do in the middle of it is change. So I'll, I'll call a different suit. So what you want to do as the person with the sheet of paper is when you say something, cross it off, because you're going to hand that off to a, another person. Or if you hear something that duplicates something on your list, cross it off. Because I'm, I'm interested here in variety, so I want to get as many different ideas as we can. Okay, so we good to go? It's not the clubs. Relax. Hearts, please. Be this close person. Stand up and share. It's you. Um, the social loafer I identified it as, but just the one in the room that doesn't bring nothing to the table, just goes with the flow. Mm -hmm. Some people are very shy. Mm -hmm. um, some of the relationships that are already existing in the group, like if you have two people who are already friends, you can get off topic and off track very easily or exclude the rest, or two people who have a problem with each other and don't allow for a discussion to happen. Okay. Diamonds, could you please take over for your team? Sure. One of the ones you mentioned was a uh, group thing. The idea that people would like push away sensing ideas or opinions from like the general consensus that group has. So, um, it, group activities can uh, be problematic for students with social anxiety disorders. Or, time constraints. Some of these classes are only 15 minutes long, so you don't have all the time you need to divvy up and actually get an idea rolling. Sometimes you're teaching something that you're not especially comfortable or strong in. Uh, so the students are not prepared for the material to this class. Okay. Um, sometimes groups are too late. Too. Okay. Um, good job. Thank you, spokespersons. Um, I'll quickly address some of those issues um, without giving you a mini lecture. Um, one of the best ways to resolve some of those issues is you choose the groups. Because if you allow students to self-select, they're going to select people they know. That's going to get you the group thing because they think alike. Um, and you won't get that diversity of opinion. You won't get the critical thinking. Um, so I deliberately choose the groups. I ask students for a data sheet 
and I actually fill out the same data sheet with my personal information, so it's not like, you know, you have to share with me, but hey, I'm not sharing with you. So I give them my data sheet as well. And that tells me their majors, it tells me um, a lot of relevant material. I teach, for example, um, children's literature. So one of the questions I ask, which would not be relevant for most of you, is do you have children? You know, and what are their ages? Because I want a reality check. Um, I can find gender. Um, often I can tell ethnicity based on names or um, if I have small classes, which I, I typically did have, um, I'll even take little notes when people are introducing themselves. But um, that way I can do my best guess at making those, those groups as diverse as possible. So whatever you ask should be relevant for your grouping, and it'll, it'll differ from class to class. Um, what were some of your other issues? Let me open this for questions. No, the, the, the know-it-alls. The know-it-alls? <laughs> um, in cooperative learning, you have ground rules. And one of the things you do to eliminate the know-it-alls are these activities. For in a uh, round table, for example, they have to wait until that sheet of paper's gone around. The know-it-alls can't be the ones who volunteer. That's why I love luck of the draw mm -hmm. and calling on the playing card, because otherwise I'd hear from the same people. And I think you raised an issue about social anxiety and you mentioned shyness. Um, students, when it's luck of the draw, it's anonymous, it's not personal, are much more likely to feel comfortable giving an answer. Plus, it's not their personal answer, it's a group answer. So it, it really um, kind of caps those students who are always the ones who want to be the spokesperson. Um, very deliberately. Any other questions about group work? What about when you put groups together, like you said that you do, you're always going to have people who are the no-shows, who maybe in one group, one person who's never in class. So how do you manage that? Um, well, two things. The good news is when you use group work, students do feel accountable. They're much less likely to miss. So there's a man named... Um, um, <coughs> Uh, Michelson, Larry Michelson, who's kept records for 10 years. He, he uses group work uh, every class period. And um, his dropout rate was something like 2%. And his attendance was like at 90%. And plus, when students feel accountable to one another, they'll email each other and you know explain they're going to be missing. Um, so that piece of it is good news. And then if, if you still have those chronic people that don't show. What I do is form groups of five and put them in one of those groups so they're not doing any harm except to themselves. Because um, when people get to know each other, they really are more likely to attend class. So on the first day of class, for example, consider doing a snowball discussion. Or there's another thing I do sometimes uh, called a three-step interview, where um, A interviews B, then B interviews that's a great first class activity because people leave knowing three people well. And that's so preferable than if we'd gone around and done 26 introductions. By the time we got to you, I'm sorry, we all would have been zoning out. Who cares? Nothing personal. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just, it's too repetitive. And it's too hard to feel any connection with people. Um, whereas if you're, if you're in a small group, with just four of you, you can you can go deeper into into what people enjoy, what they like, um, what their hobbies are, all kinds of things. So consider doing small group activities rather than the whole class introductions. Any other questions? Uh huh. Oh, absolutely. Um, we'll do some things. Um, I think later. Um, uh, focus listing, where you just have students, for example, write everything they know about a given topic. So that's active because they're writing, they're thinking, uh, but it's, it's not group-based. So no, you don't have to use groups. It's just um, a common way to, to introduce. When, when you're doing group work, automatically it's active. But you don't have to have the group to do the active. That's a great question. Uh -huh. 
isn't it possible to use a, an entire class as a group? You can, but the, the danger there is what you identified, the, the person who, who wants to talk. But, but for example, um, I took an undergrad class of class and she everybody writing class. She everybody write down four or five different things like a color, an adjective, uh, a favorite animal, a garden tool, something like that. Mm -hmm. You would write one, and you would pass it on to the next person you write. And the one you got back to okay, now, write a story in five minutes using the words you have. So everybody was involved. Oh, sure. No, that's great. Yeah, yeah no. And, and I'm assuming that was a pretty small class. Mm -hmm, yeah, 20. Okay. Um, no, that would, that would be ideal. It would be hard to do in a large auditorium, but you could. I mean, you could really do it. Um, what, what I try to avoid is, is the whole class discussion, where you pose a question, you know, who was Chaucer? Um, and then only the fastest hand in the West is going to go. You're only going to get people in the front row speaking. Whereas when you're using the playing cards, you're going to get everybody involved. Or an activity like you just described, which is definitely active learning. Yeah, good. Other questions or comments? Things to share? Okay. Well, I'll mention the whoops. Yes. Um, getting students to do the necessary work, such as the reading and the preparation and so forth, which is one of your issues, lies in what you do with it in class. It's not just me that's come to that conclusion. Um, if students don't see the point of doing homework, they're not going to do it. My homework is, is pass-fail uh, points uh, because as a composition teacher, I've done a lot of grading. In fact, the, the joke is old composition teachers never die, they just grade away. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm out of the grading business with the homework. It's uh, Depending on the complexity, I'll give anywhere from, from one to 10 points. Um, and if they do a, a decent job, I can see the effort, they get the five points or whatever it was. But I don't have to haggle over it. I don't have to you know, decide, is this a four-pointer or a three-pointer? I'm out of that business, I'm happy to say, with the homework. But I do give them the points, um, which is another incentive to do it. Plus, they know something's going to happen. We're going to use it in class. Okay, uh, we just talked about active learning. Now we're looking at interaction with others. Uh, these polar bears are interacting. I lift, you grab. Was that concept a little too complex, Carl? Um, they're also doing a little metacognition, thinking about thinking. Uh, a think tank posed this question. Um, a think tank in Michigan. And the next best answer is... Anyone want to guess? <laughs> students teaching other students. Yes, and you weren't even looking down. Absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> students teaching other students. Um, or the cartoon for that is the little engine that could receive some tutoring. Um, <laughs> tutoring is absolutely the best way to learn, that one-on-one -on -one interaction. But you can build it in your class by having students teaching other students. And you don't tell them, oh, come on, I'm, I'm too lazy to teach. I want you to teach each other. You just do it. You know, you, you've been teaching each other with the activities that we've done. You know, you've, you've all been benefiting from, from the group, uh, not group think, but, but the different ideas in your groups. So getting students teaching other students is, um, is really helpful. Okay, another thing you can do in class is um, quizzes, but kinder, gentler <coughs> quizzes. So they will, they will prepare for quizzes. Um, again, as a composition teacher, um, lit literature teacher, um, I had to give reading quizzes to get students to do the reading. I mean, it was just a sad fact. I, I wanted them to be intrinsically motivated, but alas, um, when they had so many competing things on their time, 
uh, the quizzes would get them to prepare. But you don't have to do um, graded quizzes, or they don't have to be, they can be group quizzes. So in your blue folder, you have one of these, so you can see what it looks like. How many of you have seen these before? Scratch off quizzes or if add forms? There's one in each of your folders if you want a close up of it. These things are fabulous for group quizzes. What you can do is give an individual quiz um, that the students then will hand in. Then have them take one of these um, forms and basically you scratch off to find the star and the star would tell you uh, the multiple choice answer that's correct. It's clickers are another variation of this, but clickers you do individually. The, the, the benefit of these is students teaching other students. Because what happens is you might give a 10, a ten point quiz, the students have handed it in, they're not sure how they did, and then they take it again with these scratch offs. You know where the star is because there's a little number on the bottom, that's the code, so you have a key. And you would be amazed at what happens in your class. Um, we're going to have a workshop on using these if you if you want more depth um, in how to how to do them. But students just love them. You know, they'll say, "Well, I think it's D because yada yada," and they give they give the reasons. And then someone will say, "Well, no, I, I put A because yada yada." Again, they're they're reasoning, they're thinking, they're questioning. I mean, a lot of critical thinking goes on. Then they finally decide, okay, we'll go with D. Scratch, high fives if they get it, moans if they don't. Um, you can count those um, or not. You don't really even need to give credit for them because the students are intrinsically motivated with those. There's something about the lottery, I think. You know, it's just fun to do the scratch off. If you do want to give them points. The rule in cooperative learning is you never give, uh, you never do activities that are going to drag someone's grade down. You always give them activities that will raise the grades. So if they get, say, a perfect score on that, maybe everybody in the team gets an additional point on their individual quizzes. Uh, but it should always help. Um, and you can grade those. Um, those have four. Uh, so if they get uh, get it on the first round, they could get, um, well, how does it go? I think two points. If they get it on the second scratch, they get one point. Third scratch, zero. Um, you know, just work out some kind of code. But you don't have to give credit for them. The other uh, way you can do group quizzes is uh, what's called the visible quiz. So also in your folder, uh, if you could take out that those uh, cards, they start with an A that are orange. And we'll actually do a quick physical quiz. Okay, notice, go ahead and take the, the things off. They're A, B, C, D, and true, false. And the way this works is I'll pose, again, a multiple choice question or a true, false question. You discuss it in your group reach consensus, don't hold up your card, because what happens if, say, group six holds up, you know, A, everybody will look, ooh, that's a smart group, A. Um, so you want everybody to put their card up at the same time. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you time to discuss the question, and then I'll say, ready, set, cards up. So they all go up at the same time, okay? I'm gonna give you a pretty easy test here, but it'll, Give you some practice. Okay, here is the question. First question. Oops. What do I do with that? I don't want to restart. Not doing option. No, I didn't at all. No. Don't tell it. You can't do anything. Okay, Albert? It's all yours. <laughs> I'll just read the, I'll read the quiz. Okay, first question is there are how many principles of good practice in undergraduate education? Okay, talk it over in your group. We covered this. Okay, no cheating, no going back. One's good. One's good. A, B, C, or B. Okay, so we're going to do A, B, C, or B. 
Okay, ready, set. Oh, I have to give you the numbers. <laughs> intended was B, but you gave a very good answer for A, so we'll probably tell the class. Um, no, you can all answer. answer. <laughs> Shouldn't be yeah. yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's true. Okay. And uh, the new versions of those uh, scratch-off quizzes now do have A through E, um, unlike the old ones. Okay, this is a true-false one, and this should go pretty fast. Quizzes can lead to active learning, true or false? Talk it over. What? Oh, oh, there we go. You got a T and an F. <laughs> All right, ready, set, cards up. All right. Yes, it's true. Especially if you are doing group quizzes. You're definitely getting active learning. Okay. Um, I want you to go back to your blue sheet where you brainstormed the barriers to active learning. And I hate to leave us just with this negativity, so what we're going to do is solve them. And we're going to solve them using the same approach we've been using here. Um, in the cooperative learning literature, the approach is called numbered heads together. Um, I wrote a book on cooperative learning with an accountant the guy that got that I had to teach myself. Um, he said his accounting students would laugh their heads off if he used a, you know, kind of K through 12 term like numbered heads together. So we renamed it structured problem solving. But the theory is exactly what you've seen in practice, which is you don't tell your students in advance who the spokesperson is. If you tell them in advance who the spokesperson is, that's the only person that needs to know the material. So the rest of the the students can just goof off because they're not going to be accountable for it. So you don't tell them in advance. So what I'd like you to do is go back to your list. In fact, this is a team-based activity. Can't really read that very carefully, but anyway, review the list that you brainstormed and pick out one issue, one barrier that you want to solve as a group. And we're doing fine on time, so I'm going to give you about four to five minutes. Come up with as many solutions to the problem that you identified. And there's something in cooperative learning called a sponge activity. And the sponge activity is something else that students move on to. Because when you assign group work, 
the groups will move at different paces. So you always have another accounting problem for them to solve, another poem to explicate, another psychology case to read, um, something else that they move on to. So your sponge activity for this is uh, solve a second problem. If you, you know, in four minutes, if you completely exhausted all the answers you can think of to solve your first barrier, move on to a second barrier. So, go. Have fun. I to model, give you a different model that you can use. And it's called um, Three Stay, One Astray. And basically, uh, what I'll have you do is your spokesperson will rotate and sit down with another team and give your report that way. And we'll actually do three rotations. Um, but I'm going to keep the reports deliberately very short. So talk very fast when you're giving your report, um, just so we can model the process. Um, so aces, you're going to rotate, our sixes rather, you'll rotate over to the aces. The person from the aces will rotate to the twos and you'll just go one number up. Um, so remember when you hit the sixes, you're going to hop over here and do the aces when we do the next rotation. Okay? So I would like, please, let's see, who haven't we used yet? Uh, the person holding the spade to please be the spokesperson. And we want to make everyone accountable so the three people who are who are left, okay, this is important, the three people who are left, each of them is responsible for briefing their spokesperson because the spokesperson doesn't get to hear other reports. Um, so when they get back, you're going to say, this is what we learned from the first reporter. This is, and then another person will say, this is what we learned from the second one. So you're, everyone's accountable for understanding the reports. The nice thing about this is you can ask questions because it's a small group. You're not standing up in the front of the room shaking um, where only this, a sadist would ask a question. Um, and you get better at it the more rotations you do, which is why I, I, I do three. And your sponge activity, if you give your, your one minute report in 30 seconds, um, is then the team you're sitting with will share what their problem was or their barrier and their solution to it. Not likely to happen though, because we're going to do this very fast. Okay, uh, persons holding the spade, please rotate and give your report in the next number up. Thank you, spokesperson. Spokesperson, please rotate one number higher. Give your report again. I'll have the instructor sign a grade, and also have the individual group members kind of on that. Uh, probably so, uh, if you solve what the choice of textbook, like what if it's a textbook? Sometimes, uh, okay, very quickly, because we're reaching the end of uh, our time here, brief your or, uh, spokesperson. Just quickly summarize what you learned from the three visitors. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh my God. Um, yeah. Um, I apologize if you didn't quite get through it all. Oh, you don't get it. Um, but I want to end with the cartoons, Molly, and then we need to use your clickers. Um, the good news for students and teachers is there is no one single best method of teaching. So I'm not going to say use cooperative learning or only use active learning. And as we've seen, there are lots of variations on on active learning. So the, the moral, the lesson here is think it through. Be purposeful when you're teaching. So um, some final thoughts. Don't try to do it all. For example, folders are a huge step. I wouldn't try folders. 
Uh, by the way, some of you are putting your folder stuff away. Thank you. You can be doing that as we do the cartoon finale. So don't try to hook a whale. Remember that you have to organize for active learning. You just threw everything together, Matthew. A posse is something you have to organize. <laughs> Get your students to buy into it. The zebras are not buying into those plans. <laughs> Model for your students, hang them, you idiots, hang them, string them up as a figure of speech. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so model what you want your students to do. And finally, take some risks. If we pull this off, <laughs> we'll eat like kings. <laughs> <laughs> so I say you do it, and trichinosis be damned. Try active learning. You'll like it. Okay, turn on your clickers. <laughs>